welcome to worship today as we continue to celebrate the resurrection. In fact, today's service is all about resurrection and we read our way through much of chapter 15 of the first letter we have that Paul wrote to the followers of Jesus in Corinth, where he explains a lot about resurrection. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. And now I want to remind you, my friends, of the good news which I preached to you, which you received, and on which our faith stands firm. That is the gospel, the message that I preached to you. You are saved by the gospel if you hold firmly to it, unless it was for nothing that you believed. I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins, as written in the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised to life three days later, as written in the scriptures, that he appeared to Peter and then to all twelve apostles. Then he appeared to more than five hundred of his followers at once, most of whom are still alive, although some have died. Then he appeared to James, and afterwards to all the apostles. of prayer. Let's pray. God, creator of all that there is, you are sovereign God, ruler of nations, even in the trouble we find ourselves in. As we gather in worship, be with us and assure us, help our faith. There are so many negative things that try to get us down. We all have our own story of mixed success in living with joy. O risen Christ, as you have overcome death, enable us to share in your victory over everything that makes for death. Give us faith, O God, that goodness is stronger than evil and love stronger than hate. Give us faith that you who connects us is far stronger than all forces of division. We need faith, O God to see that light is stronger than darkness and life stronger than death, all because of your mighty work in Christ. We continue in prayer in the way you taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. 
for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Now, since our message is that Christ has been raised from death, how can some of you say that the dead will not be raised to life? If that is true, it means that Christ was not raised. And if Christ has not been raised from death, then we have nothing to preach and you have nothing to believe. More than that, we're shown to be lying about God because we said that he raised Christ from death. But if it is true that the dead are not raised to life, then he did not raise Christ. For if the dead are not raised, neither has Christ been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is a delusion and you're still lost in your sins. It would also mean that the believers in Christ who have died are lost. If our hope in Christ is good for this life only and no more, then we deserve more pity than anyone else in all the world. But the truth is that Christ has been raised from death as the guarantee that those who sleep in death will also be raised. Mr Smith, <gasps> Mr Jones, how good to see you. Welcome to Canny Communicate Consultant. Canny Communicate Consultants? I see. Canny, at your service, it seems you have an idea to promote. Something called Christianity. What's it all about, Mr Jones? Well, it's a religion. <gasps> There's a big market out there for that kind of thing. Tell me more. Basically, it's about a baby called Jesus who is born into poverty and who grows up under the cruelty and domination of the Roman Empire. Human interest and a bit of drama too. I like it already. You're speaking my kind of language, Mr Jones. Please continue. This Jesus brings good news that God is very near. And more than this, Jesus tells that God's presence can be found in the lives of very ordinary people, sometimes when they least expect it. If they get close to God, then God can change them, and also change the world. Hmm, sounds a bit theological to me. Oh, very. You see, the argument goes like this. If God exists, and if God loves not just the great and the good, then it kind of follows that the whole world should know all about it. Adults, children, grannies, everyone really. Everyone, how utterly fabulous. What a God-given public relation opportunity. So tell me more about this Jesus of yours. Okay, Jesus sees God as his heavenly father and that he has been called by God to change the world. While Rome's empire is all about cruelty and brutality and violence to keep the rich rich and poor poor, God's kingdom is about grace and openness and equality and community and compassion. Let me guess. That message didn't go down well with Rome. Correct. Lots of people thought that Jesus was a troublemaker. And was he? <laughs> of course he was. He told everyone that in God's kingdom, the poor and weak and rejected actually find a place of acceptance. That kind of thing can make you lots of powerful enemies, you know. Let me get this straight. You want us to tell all the world about this guy who takes on the power of Roman Empire and wins? Well, to tell you the truth, it's a bit more complicated than that. He actually takes on the power of the Roman Empire and loses. Loses? Yes, loses. I think I need to know more about this. Tease it out for me a little, if you will. Quite simply, they kill him. Crucified, dead and buried. That was on the Friday. But then, on the Sunday... Go on. Well, on the Sunday... Everything changes. People who'd seen him dying on the Friday say they've seen Jesus again. Maybe not exactly as he was before, but nonetheless, there's something that completely convinces those friends of Jesus that he's back, back on Easter Sunday. Dead human, being coming back to life, eh? That's quite a story. Oh, it is. 
In the days after Easter, Jesus' friends turn around from being a sad, scared bunch of no-hopers into being changed people. Changed people who are fired up and ready to work for the risen Jesus towards a better world. A better world? That would be the world to come, I take it. The heavenly world up in the sky. Angels, harps, clouds, that sort of stuff. No, 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 not at all. That's not what resurrection is. The message of Jesus is that change starts with this world. Political change, economic change, real change for those oppressed or ignored by the world, but who are loved by God. Changed lives, changed vision, love and justice in the here and now. That's what this crucified Jesus lived for and died for and rose again for. That's what resurrection is. And you think a cross, a symbol of torture and destruction, should be a symbol of resurrection? Well, I did think of a butterfly, which symbolises the beauty of renewal. Or a rainbow as a sign of hope. But the cross is what changed everything, with the upright pointing to God, as well as the horizontal reaching out to each other. That's a genius, actually. Or just canny communication. <gasps> You're on... So what is all this resurrection stuff? There are two quotes to hold on to today. One is from Michael Ramsey, who was Archbishop of Canterbury from 1961 to 74. And he said very simply, no resurrection, no Christianity. It's as basic as that. The other quote is 1550 years earlier from Augustine of Hippo, who was an African bishop born 354 AD in Hippo, which is now in Algeria, and he said something sort of similar. We are an Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. So two things to hold on to. No resurrection, no Christianity. We are an Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. Another bishop who made the news regarding the resurrection was David Jenkins, who was Bishop of Durham from 1984 to 94. I don't know if you remember, but he got everyone talking about the resurrection, though largely because he was misquoted. As part of a longer interview, he said that he didn't believe the resurrection was a conjuring trick with bones. And somehow that got completely turned in its head to say he didn't believe in the resurrection. And in fact, he was saying the opposite. It wasn't a conjuring trick with bones. It was resurrection. But it did get everybody talking in the streets and pubs of Durham and far wider. And when then lightning struck York Minster around the time of his consecration, I think that's what happens to bishops, some people were glad to claim it was the wrath of God. I prefer the simpler explanation that my friends in Five Youth Choir were about to sing in York Minster that week, and maybe it was that that brought the lightning instead. But suddenly, 
Durham, throughout the country, people were talking about whether the resurrection was real. It was not a conjuring trick with bones, but central to everything. Someone will ask, How can the dead be raised to life? What kind of body will they have? You fool, when you plant a seed in the ground, it does not sprout to life unless it dies. And what you plant is a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain, not the full-bodied plant that will later grow up. God provides that seed with the body he wishes. He gives each seed its own proper body. And the flesh of living beings is not all the same kind of flesh. Human beings have one kind of flesh, animals another, birds another, and fish another. And there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. The beauty that belongs to heavenly bodies is different from the beauty that belongs to earthly bodies. The sun has its own beauty, the moon another beauty, and the stars a different beauty. And even among stars there are different kinds of beauty. This is how it will be when the dead are raised to life. When the body is buried, it is mortal. When raised, it will be immortal. When buried, it is ugly and weak. When raised, it will be beautiful and strong. When buried, it is a physical body. When raised, it will be a spiritual body. There is, of course, a physical body. So there has to be a spiritual body. Are we in our lives just bones that will eventually turn to dust? If that is the case, and we eventually end to dust and nothing else, then resurrection would be a super biological trick, like juggling and conjuring. But of course it was not a trick. Seeds, like for this plant, um, look a bit dead. Um, here you've got a nasturtium seed, and I find it looks like a skull a bit. But invisibly, this seed is programmed for a new life, a different life from what it looks like now. So we are a bit like seeds, we are programmed for a different life. If only we let ourselves die in our old natural shell, shed it and sprout into new life. Resurrection is about change in our entire life. Listen to this secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised never to die again, and we shall all be changed. For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place, and the mortal has been changed into the immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Where death is your victory, where death is your power to hurt. Death gets its power to hurt from sin, and sin gets its power from the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, my dear friends, stand firm and steady. Keep busy always in your work for the Lord, since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. Death, where is your victory? What does resurrection mean in our own lives? Jesus coming through death. At every service at the crematorium, I say the words, as the curtain of life closes, so also it opens on the other side to the dawn of God's glory. They're words that I was asked to say at one particular service, and I've continued ever since. What is it like to come through death, to come out the other side? And in Jesus' case, to come out actually this side again, to live the resurrection. I began to understand that better early one Easter morning in the church garden when we sang Morning is Broken, a 
song that up to that point I'd never been particularly fond of. But we sang it then as Jesus stepping out into the resurrection and it transformed the song for me completely. Let's do it now. Sing of the resurrection. Sing of your resurrection. Stepping out of the grave and into the light. Morning is broken. Resurrection is God's recreation, not just of the new day, but also of ourselves. The very first Christians, once Jesus had risen, went through massive changes, affecting their thinking, daily living, their faith. They changed from simply following Jesus into people with an even deeper horizon in life. For them, the brutality of this world was no longer the be-all, end-all, their being was now resurrected. Their fear was no longer of death. They knew they were far more than bones or dust. Our reality, too, is no longer that death is in charge at the end of the day. No, our reality is now that God is in charge of everything. Resurrection is about far more than the body of Jesus walking, eating and talking again. It goes far beyond believing in heaven. It is true for the now and the here. Resurrection means God is pushing away all that and everything that makes for death. God's love will always win. Nothing can keep us apart from God's love. All lives marked by Christ are utterly changed. This bold newness was started by Jesus' resurrection. It is like it is said, we are an Easter people and Alleluia is our song. And resurrection is now the norm for us. No, not death and taxes, but resurrection. What I mean is, resurrection is the norm in nature. Wherever we look, look outside. On, on from death follows resurrection. New life in spring, very naturally it follows. With our eyes truly open, we see it in other things too. From waste and death can spring new life and better ways. Seeing the resurrection as the norm in all of our lives means... God's natural order of resurrection is offended against when aid workers are targeted and shot whilst out help helping starving people. God's natural order of resurrection is assaulted where violence is used to kick down a person who is finding her or his own way of life. Yes, today there are wars against Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan and others. There are famine and oppression, but they are affronts to God's work of peace, justice and reconciliation. There are hate and violence and lies, but they are abnormal. They are affronts against God's natural order. Death, decay and destruction are actually 
the suspension of the laws of nature. And the resurrection of Christ is the normal principle of reality. It's not the other way round. Sin and death are defeated. Even though our world, our lives are full of hopelessness and despair, full of broken promises, death and darkness will never have the last word. The worst thing will never be the last thing. Our hopes for a better world are no longer limited. Resurrection is the norm. Through the risen Christ, God reconciles everything to God. There's hope without any restrictions. Desmond Tutu was a vital tool of God in the fight against apartheid in South Africa, against violence by the authorities, against violence in society, and for an equal and diverse society. So I'm reading to you words from a prayer book of Desmond Tutu. Goodness is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Light is stronger than darkness. Life is stronger than death. Victory is ours. Victory is ours through God who loves us. Alleluia. It is still good news for today. Lord, we thank you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you again today for the great miracle of your resurrection and for everything it reveals about your awesome love. We remember how the disciples refused to believe, dismissing the women's words as nonsense, when they suddenly, you were there, standing among them, speaking your word, peace be with you. It's still good news for today. Lord, we thank you. We remember how in Jesus you came to people in despair, lives bowed down in sorrow or in loneliness, minds struggling to accept reality. We thank you for this time of worship and togetherness. And we ask that you renew us in body, mind and soul. We offer you what we cannot change. Help us to make most of the lives we have. It is still good news for today. Lord, we thank you. God, we pray with everyone who longs for a fuller life, a greater freedom of life or free of restriction. Give us a richer understanding of your love, which you taught and lived among us through the cross to your resurrection. We pray for all who live and who work in war zones, who live under constant threat to their lives, especially remembering Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan, so many other places. We also pray for all who are struggling in life and all who have great troubles to overcome. Be with them and with all of us and help us to stand together in times of need. We too are your children. It is still good news for today. Lord, we thank you. And as you spoke of the seeds that must die in order to bring fullness of life, we pray to you where there is hopelessness. May we plant seeds of hope, where we meet fear and anxiety, may we plant seeds of confidence, where there's hate, may we plant seeds of love, where people want to learn, may we plant seeds of possibility, where people want to give up, may we plant seeds of resilience. Make us workers with you, Lord, in your project of creation. Help us to nurture good, stable ground and help us to plant seeds that grow. It's still good news for today. Lord, we thank you. So help us to live your hope, love and joy with our whole existence. To pass on and tell your story, to believe and to live your resurrection. It's still good news for today. Lord, we thank you. Amen. Thank you.
the resurrection where you are. The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you, remain with you now and always. Amen.